Uh, okay, so uh, welcome everybody to today's uh, chaos seminar. And uh, our speaker today is uh, Benjamin Ropik, whose name you should uh, spell correctly, please. And he's going to speak about handle bodies, trivial tangles, and group trisections for knotted surfaces. Yeah, thanks for the intro and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, yeah, this is a joint project with Sarah Blackwell, Rob Kirby, Michael Klug, and Vincent Longo. And we started this at one of the uh, Trisectors workshops, um, which are organized by Jeff Meyer and Alex Zupan. Um, so those are great workshops where you meet and then um, split into groups and work on something. And um, I just want to show you what we came up with um, and kept working on afterwards. And the outline of my talk is pretty much the title. I, um, speak about handle bodies for a bit, then trivial tangles, and at the end, um, about this four-dimensional perspective and what this has to do with trisections and knotted surfaces. Okay, um, handle bodies. Here's how you build a handle body. You start with the surface of genus G, and then um, if I give you a cut system on this surface, um, which is a collection of disjoint curves in purple here, then I can attach two handles, so thickened disks along these curves. In this case, you can actually see the disks. So this is like a, um, a D2 times D1 attached along its boundary S1 times D1. Something like a coin or a hockey puck, we, we glued it into this surface. Um, and now the inside boundary of the thing we've just built um, is a two sphere. Maybe you can try to see this here. Um, on the inside. And so we can fill it up with a three ball. And what we obtain with this process is we build some three manifold with boundary this surface sigma G. So that cutting along these disks gives us a three ball. And that's pretty much the definition of a handle body. It's a, a okay. thing with yeah. surface boundary. Down. Down. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a thing with surface boundary so that you can cut along a system of disks and obtain three balls. And of course, these handle bodies can be more complicated than the picture I've just shown you. So maybe let's look at this one and. Um, try to visualize it. So what we're doing here is we glue in disks along these longitudinal curves. And then the three ball we have to put in to fill this up is like on the outside together with the point at infinity. And what you should be seeing is like the, um, the outside handle body of this Higgard splitting of S3. Um, and at the bottom here, um, I find it hard to visualize this, um, but you just have to remember this process. We, we attach disks to the um, curves I've drawn and then fill in any two sphere components we see with three balls. Um, so this was the warm up. Now let's look at more complicated handle bodies. This is um, yet another genus two surface um, with two embedded curves on it. And I've drawn them in slightly different colors. So this delta one is in purple and the delta two is in blue. You'll see why I do this in a second. Um, but um, yeah, let's just stop for a bit. And I, I, I hope I'm not elaborating this point too much, but what this picture means, it's start with the surface, attach disks, thicken disks along these curves, and then fill in any holes you have with three balls. Um, okay. So those are the main characters in our story, these handle bodies. Um, and now, this talk will be about an interplay between topology and algebra. 
Uh, in particular, what we'll see is that in this case, the algebra guides the topology or uh, knows a lot about the topological situation. So what I mean by algebra is this handle body, this topological object, um, I can associate a group homomorphism to this, um, which is the induced map on pi one from the inclusion of the boundary surface into this handle body. For example, here, the boundary surface is a genus two, um, two manifold, and I can find generators for its pi one. So in this case, let's say I've picked like the symplectic basis for, um, of curves on the surface, x1, y1, x2, y2. And I can calculate or see where these generators on the surface map to in pi one of the handle body we've just built. So such a handle body always has pi one, a free group, um, because a different way of describing handle bodies is you start with a zero handle and then you attach one handle to it, each one handle giving a free generator for pi one. We have this topological object, in this case, this genus two handle body. I can write down this algebra map. So for example, here, um, you know, X1 is mapping to like D1 inverse and Y1 is mapping to some long word in these three generators. And so the surprising fun fact is that this algebra determines all of the topology. So what I'm telling you is just from this map on the bottom here, like this thing, the box, I claim that I can recover the handle body or the system of curves on the surface. Um, so this is a good point to ask for questions and um, because this is the setup we'll be working in and um, maybe I can clarify something right now. Rushed over. Yeah, so just to make sure, you always assume that the curves on the surface, they're non-separating, right? Yeah, um, you can have separating curves on the surface in a cut system. Maybe, maybe I flip back, yeah. Um, but the only thing this will do is you will, um, for example, if you have this one here, um, if you fill this up with a disk, then you just get an additional stupid three bar in here. That's um, not always the case, right? You could have like the one, imagine the curve that separates the two, like the two halves of your surface. That's a separating curve. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but then again, what this would just do is it, it would cut one of the three bytes into two three bytes. Um, and so um, it doesn't really matter for the object you're describing. Sure, I just wanted to know what you meant exactly by a system of curves. So it's a collection of yeah. non-separating curves that are in the correct number so that uh, they give you a, like- a yeah, um, yeah, exactly. A different perspective could be it's a collection of curves so that surgery of the surface along these curves gives you a disjoint union of two spheres. Um, because adding these two handles or gluing in these two handles on the boundary, what it's doing, it's removing these annuli around the curves and then gluing in two discs, so exactly a surgery. Um, and you want to have enough curves so that the genus of the surface has been reduced to be a distant union of genus zero things. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So my setup is, I'm, I'm, I just continue now. So my setup is I have this map from a surface group to a free group. Um, I have the surface as my stop sign. And um, now I want to recover these curves on the surface inducing this map. Um, okay, here in this corner, I've just um, written down the map again with some sign conventions and color conventions because 
um, the two different two handles from earlier corresponded to these two different generators. Um, all right, and um, now let's try to find the curves. So the first step in this process is this map here is a homomorphism, which means that this surface relation on the left holds true in the image of these generators in the free group. So this surface relation is like a product of commutators is trivial. And if I write down this product of commutators in the free group, with the images, then this long word is trivial in the free group. Um, okay, so um, we'll use this property that this word is trivial in the following way. Um, you know that a word in a free group is trivial if and only if you can cancel any occurrence of neighboring letters x times x inverse. Keep canceling until you end up with the empty word or with the trivial word. And now, whenever I do such a cancellation, I try to realize this cancellation geometrically in this picture where I've um, started by drawing these like tiny pieces of the curve intersecting um, the boundary exactly how the image is telling me. So for example, here, we know y1 maps to this product in the free group. And now I have drawn these tiny starting segments here um, according to how this intersection should happen. Now I cancel neighboring letters in this word. And whenever I do such a cancellation, I draw in geometrically this arc connecting the two segments which are canceled. Um, let me just do another cancellation. So I, for example, this D1 here cancels with this D1 where this thing corresponded to um, a letter in Y1. This corresponded to a letter in X1. In this reduction of the word in the free group, these two letters cancel each other. And so I draw in this arc, completing a piece of the curve. But I mean, a priori, uh, I don't know if this can really happen, but uh, um, a priori, sometimes you have choices, right? You have uh, maybe if you have uh, D1 minus one, D1, Di minus one, yeah. D1, then uh, in principle, you have choices. Um, yeah, um, that's a very good point. And um, the thing is, the choices don't matter. Um, you can do these cancellations however you want. You know from this property of a free group that However, you do the cancellations, you always end up in the trivial world, which means all of these initial segments will be joined up at the end. And then you're right that um, different cancellations might give you different cut systems, but the handle body described by the cut system is unique. And the proof of this uniqueness is a direct application of Dean's lemma. Dean Slammer tells you that whenever a curve in the boundary of a three manifold is null homotopic in the three manifold, then there exists an embedded disk bounding this curve. And you can use this to show that the two handle bodies, however we constructed them, have to be homeomorphic. Thank you. Um, OK. 
Okay, so um, I, I'm now realizing my description of the algorithm was probably super confusing, but maybe your takeaway should be, I, I just say it again, we have this epimorphism from a surface group to a free group where we know that the surface generators satisfy the surface relation. So we look at the surface relation in the free group, we cancel it down, and whenever we cancel, we can use this to draw an arc, which will be part of our cut system. Um, this gives you a way of going from algebra to topology. And here's a kind of summary slide. This is what we just proved. It's that any epimorphism from a surface group to a free group is realized geometrically by a handle body. And this word uniquely is what I just said um, in response to the question about uniqueness of cancellation. Uh, a Dean lemma argumentates you that this handle body is uniquely determined by the map. Um, this result is actually really old. It's, I would call it a folklore result because um, we didn't find an original source for this, but I still want to present you like the standard proof that you find written down in many places. Given such a homomorphism from a surface group to a free group, we can always realize it by um, a map from a surface to a wedge of spheres, circles, um, because both the surface and this wedge of circles is an Einberg McLean space. Um, and so you know that maps on pi one correspond unique up to homotopy to maps of the surface to this wedge. And then by wiggling this map a little or by a homotopy, you can make it transverse to these north poles of the wedge circles. And then the pre-image of these north poles will be a one-dimensional submanifold of the surface. So a collection of curves. Um, and now this is kind of circling back to Jose's question from earlier. Um, you could see too many curves in this pre-image. So there might be parallel curves like this or like a separating curve like this, but with a little more work, you can prove that this pre-image always contains a cut system. You, so you can always throw out unnecessary curves. Um, and so now circling back to this, um, this is our first contribution in this project. Or uh, at least we, I, I claim that the, that we. Um, that we came up with this algorithm to actually do this process and not just this abstract argument with the um, realizing it by a map and pre-image and so on. So um, with this cancellation process, we can realize these epimorphisms as handle bodies in an algorithmic way. Um, all right. Um, this is probably also a good place for questions again. Um, otherwise I'd go on and um, as a short aside, why am I talking about handle bodies so much? Um, if you, well, I'm pretty sure if you're a low dimensional topologist, you know that three manifolds and four manifolds, we can always cut them into handle bodies. And then the magic or the information is contained in how these handle bodies are glued together. So for example, any three manifold, we can write it as the union of two handle bodies. It's called a Higgard splitting. Um, and each such Higgard splitting is now um, like a pair of epimorphisms from a surface group to a free group because you have generators of pi one on the central surface. And 
some of them die when you map them into the orange handle body and maybe a different collection is killed when you map it to the purple handle body. And now the surprising fact is that this algebra information, so this pair of surjections determines the three manifold. Um, so this appeared a long time ago in a in a Jacko's thesis and also in a paper of Stallings. Um, I'll just show you two examples of this to illustrate this. For example, here's the genus two splitting of the three sphere with the purple handle body, the thing we can actually see in front of us, the solid inside. The orange handle body is the compactified outside. And now the two maps from the central surface to the two handle bodies are written down here. And just from looking at this algebra, you could realize that this is a three sphere. Now, similarly here, this is a lens space um, with a genus one Higgard splitting. Um, so it's cut into two solid tori. And if I know where the generators of the boundary torus are being mapped, then the splitting homomorphism tells me I'm looking at a lens space. And so this is a theorem of Stallings and Jaco that the collection of parametrized Hegart splittings of a manifold corresponds in a one-to-one -one way to these group bisections of splitting homomorphisms. So these decompositions of my fundamental group of the three manifold into two free groups glued along a surface group. And there's also an upgraded statement if you model the stabilization here. Um, there's an algebraic way of stabilizing these maps and then you get a correspondence between the collection of three manifolds and this algebraic set up to stabilization. But um, may I ask if, so is it is it easy to actually, uh, when, whenever you have a pair of two such things to know if, I mean, of the algebraic setting to know yeah. if they are, I mean, stabilization is, is it like uh, algorithmic? Uh, can, you, mm, um, can you say a word about that? So the problem is hard because um, you, you have to make this into an equivalence relation by saying you can stabilize and destabilize. And so given two splitting homomorphisms, um, it's really hard to prove or disprove that they are the same because it could be that you need to stabilize it first and then destabilize a bunch um, to arrive this result. Um, and in a sense, this algebra problem is exactly as hard as the geometry problem. And um, so I'm not an expert on this. I don't know whether, um, yeah, three manifold recognition is algorithmic. Or I, if I hand you two Hegart splittings, can you algorithmically determine whether they are of the same three manifold? I mean, I can't, yeah. but I think it is possible. I mean, I think there's mm -hmm. an algorithm. Yeah. Um, but uh, still, it's it's a challenge because if you were to do this in practice, it's probably hard to deal with this stabilizing and destabilizing at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so the plan for the remaining 35 minutes is to move up one dimension and uh, recall the story for four manifolds. Um, because due to um, Dave Gay and Rob Kirby, we know that four manifolds can be trisected and so dis be described as um, three handle bodies meeting in a specific overlap pattern. And then at the very end, I, I come back to 
what our project was originally about um, because we were trying to generalize this to the relative setting of a bridge trisected surface inside of a trisected four manifold and um, see how these splitting homomorphisms and group trisections work in the setting. All right, so um, a group trisection is the four dimensional analog of the splitting homomorphism where instead of having two epimorphisms from a surface group to a free group, now we have three. You can, if you see this tripod here, I have a red, red epimorphism, a blue and a green one. And we also need to put a further condition on this. Um, we require each pair of these epimorphisms to push out to a free group. Um, so I, I have these two free groups being glued along a surface group. Um, in principle, this could give you lots of different kinds of groups, all three manifold groups, for example. Um, but in what we're doing, we always want these pairwise gluings to give us free groups again. Um, all right, and now I tell you how this tripod of epimorphisms constructs a four manifold. And it's pretty much just the handle body story three times. I have this red epimorphism, which by our earlier folklore theorem tells us that there's a red handle body realizing this epimorphism. So what I do is I take my central surface, I thicken it up a bit to be four dimensional. So I just cross it with a two disc. And then I tack on this red handle body to like the top. And there's a blue epimorphism. So a blue handle body, and I can glue it to um, maybe um, like a, one third of the way around this two disc factor on my thickened surface. And then lastly, there's a green epimorphism with a green handle body. And so I've built this thing appearing off from a thickened surface and three handle bodies. Um, the trisection people usually draw all three handle bodies onto or their cut systems onto the same central surface. So this picture is describing the red handle body, the blue handle body, and the green. And now um, this thing is a weird object right now. I would like to construct a closed four manifold out of it. And so we should maybe think about what this boundary component is. And what we're seeing here is exactly something like a Heger splitting. We have the handle body being glued to another handle body along the surface. And now we remember that we put this maybe strange condition on the pairwise pushouts. They give us free groups. But now, we're looking at a three manifold, like a Hegel splitting of a three manifold with a free fundamental group. And then we know from um, like Kniezer's theorem on the connect sum decompositions of manifolds where the group is a free product and the Poincaré conjecture that this manifold has to be a connected sum of S1 times S2s. And whenever a four manifold topologist sees this manifold, they immediately call upon this theorem of Laudenbach Poinaru that we can fill it in with a four dimensional handle body uh, with a boundary connect sum of S1 times D3s. And we can do this three times, once for each of these pairwise unions. Um, 
And in the end, what we've built is a four manifold whose decomposition of pi one corresponds exactly to this cube or this group transaction we started with. Um, and this is the big result in this paper of um, Dave Gay, Rob, Rob Kirby, and uh, Aaron Abrams that the trisections of a four manifold are in one to one correspondence to the group trisections of its fundamental group. And again, there's a way of modding out stabilizations both topologically and algebraically. Um, so in theory, studying four manifolds is group theory, but it's really hard group theory. Um, and I should have said smooth at some point, so all of this only works for smooth four manifolds because this whole trisection um, business depends on things being smooth and more theory working. Yeah. Okay, and um, again, this is a good place for questions because now I move on to surfaces in four manifolds, um, but it's uh, useful to um, like understand this case first. Yeah, yeah so uh, sorry, Ben, maybe you said this, but trisections modulus stabilization, is that just the uh, up to, uh, is that just four manifolds up to diffeomorphism? Yeah, exactly. This is, uh, um, yeah, I should have said this earlier. The Ryder Meister Singer theorem tells you that the Hegel splittings of three manifolds up to stabilization is exactly three manifolds. And there's an analog of this for trisections. So uh, the same manifold might have different trisections, but there's a stabilization move where you pretty much just connect some with a genus one trisection of the phosphere. And then any two trisections of the same four manifold. Um, become the same after stabilizing both of them enough. Um, so this set on the top here after modding out by stabilization is the set of smooth four manifolds. Yeah. All right, thanks. So this, doesn't this have an like a far reaching implication for just finitely presented groups because any group is the fundamental group of yeah. those four manifolds. So it means that every group, like every finitely uh, presented group is a trisection in a unique way up to some stabilization procedure that we didn't know. Uh, no, it isn't because the different, so a group can have different group trisections corresponding to different four manifolds. So, for example, there are simply connected manifolds like CP2 or S2 times S2, which are not the same. And those give you different trisections of the trivial group, even after modding out the stabilization move. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But um, you, you just mentioned a, a, a cool fun fact every finitely presented group. Um, appears as the fundamental group of a four manifold. And so as a conclusion, every finitely presented group admits a group trisection. And just from the algebraic thing, this, uh, I don't know how you would prove this, some of the proof goes through the geometry. So maybe to go on on that. So is it so given a group? Uh, I mean, a finitely presented group. Is it easy to actually construct a trisection? Um, I mean, okay. No, you just said yeah. it's no. Okay, you just said it's difficult. Sorry. Uh, I'm just yeah. No. No. It's this is a very good question, and uh, um, I'm still not happy with the answer we are giving. The best process probably is you realize the group as a four manifold. There are various ways of doing this. You can. Um, like build a handle body, realizing the group presentation and double it. And then you have a four manifold. 
And then you trisect this four manifold and then you write down its group trisection. So it's a very roundabout way. Yeah. Okay. Um, surfaces in four manifolds. Um, here's a picture of a knotted surface in the four sphere. This is supposed to be a spun trefoil knot. Um, there are very many very interesting two dimensional knots in the four sphere and also two dimensional knotted surfaces in various four manifolds. Usually it's hard to think of these things because we, um, yeah, we're not used to thinking about knotted surfaces, um, but there's a cool way of um, representing them in so-called bridge trisected position. And this was invented by um, Jeff Meyer and Alex Supan, where um, you just hand me a triple of trivial tangles. So a red tangle, a blue tangle, and a green tangle with the extra condition that if you put two of them together, this is supposed to form an unlink in the three sphere. So just like here, if this red tangle, the blue tangle, putting it together gives me an unlink because then I can make this unlink bound a collection of disks in the four dimensional sector um, that is like coming out at us in this picture here. Um, and if I find such a triple of trivial tangles so that each of these pairwise unions is an unlink, I can fill in each pair with disks and then this whole thing tells me how the disks fit together to build some knotted surface thing. So um, this is super cool because just as trisections somehow reduce the four dimensions to just a collection of the triple of cut systems on a surface, these bridge trisections reduce like the complexity of a knotted surface into just a triple of trivial tangles. And um, just as I started my talk talking about or talking a long time about handle bodies, now I talk 10 minutes about trivial tangles, the ingredients in this bridge trisection. So a trivial tangle is um, in the three ball, let's say, um, just a collection of properly embedded arcs so that there's a mass function in which each tangle strand has a unique minimum. So for example, this thing here is not a trivial tangle. Um, we like trivial tangles because you can push them onto the boundary sphere and then just represent them with the so-called shadow diagram. Um, so like this collection of dots together with arcs um, is a faithful representation of this trivial tangle. And now this is an exercise. Um, if you take this tangle here, and you push the tangle strands onto the boundary sphere, um, you see something like this here. Sorry, what you, earlier you said that all not all surfaces in a four manifold can be obtained, uh, like can be described by these uh, triples of tangles. And do you also yeah. know also if there is a statement about like any two representations differ by some stabilization sort of move? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, there is. <laughs> yeah, there is. I, 
I can't add, add anything to what you just said. This is precisely the statement. Anything can be bridge trisected and it's unique up to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. And um, so since, yeah, since we can describe any knotted surface in this way, um, this has become an area of active study, these bridge trisections, because now you, you have this new perspective where you yeah, cut it off, where the complicated knotted object is described by just these triple of tangles. Um, and what I'm going to do in the next five or 10 minutes is I play the same game from the beginning. I show you why the algebra determines the topology for these trivial tangles as well. And then at the end, I tell you what this um, implies for knotted surfaces. Okay, so given such a trivial tangle, in this example, this is now a, a blue strand and a red strand, um, I can write down the induced map on pi one from the inclusion of the boundary punctured sphere into the tangle complement. The punctured sphere, its group is a punctured surface group. The tangle complement group is a free group. Um, the map is determined by just telling you where these generators, tiny loops around the punctures go in the tangle complement. And now the challenge is just from the algebra trying to recover the topology again. Um, I, I flip back to the slide. Um, so from now on, I always draw the things as these shadow diagrams because it's easier to describe the algorithm in this perspective. Um, but you should remember that such a shadow diagram represents a tangle in a three ball, just as the cut system was representing the actual geometric geometric thing, the antibody. And pretty much the same procedure as earlier works in this case here. We have this map in algebra. The surface group had some relation which its generators had to satisfy. So in the image of these surface generators, this relation needs to be satisfied as well. And whenever we have a relation in a free group, we know that we can um, just cancel it down to the trivial word. So again, around these punctures, we place these tiny initial segments. And now we cancel adjacent letters. And whenever we cancel, we insert an arc between the corresponding pieces. Um, cancel. And at some point, you'll, you'll be done with the cancellation. Um, and now in this case, there's one additional step um, because we, we only filled in like the outside of these um, regions around the punctures. And now we are putting kind of like a rainbow pattern close to the puncture to close up the things into actual curves. Um, okay, so far so good. This is giving me some collection of curves on my surface. But then we ran into an additional problem because what we actually want is a shadow diagram. So a collection of arcs connecting um, different punctures. But as you might see in this case here, what we ended up with is some weird closed circles in this picture. Um, yeah, uh, about that, um, when you yeah. said, uh... I mean, in this um, in this diagrams, you didn't. I mean, you didn't say explicitly that you didn't want some close connected to a component. So, are you? Is it allowed? Yeah. Uh, so, it's, 
exactly it's not allowed to have this here because there's no geometrical interpretation of this like right now we are talking about these trivial tangles so those are like properly embedded arcs and if you push them to the boundary you'll still okay. get just arcs yeah so this is bad and at this point we were like uh i don't know desperate uh we thought uh, none of this is going to work um but then we realized that we didn't use one property of our situation, namely that this map here is subjective. So this is an epimorphism. And so this was saving us and everything is working out now. Um, and along the way, we, we learned about an interesting procedure called Stallings folding. Um, Apparently, this is something geometric group theorists study, studied a lot. This is a procedure for proving that a given set of words in the free group actually generates the free group. So, for example, if I hand you like this collection of four words in the free group XY, how do you calculate or prove which subgroup this spans? Um, and the answer is use the Starling's folding algorithm where you draw a wedge of circles, each circle being labeled in segments according to the word. So for example, here, this word y, x, x, y, x inverse, you, you draw the circle labeled segments along this word. Um, and then you fold two edges onto each other whenever they are incident and have the same label. So for example, here, um, I have these two edges, both labeled Y being joined at their feet. And then I fold these together. And there's a covering space argument, which tells you that if this process of folding terminates at a wedge of, in this case, two circles, then the words you started with generate the free group. Um, Okay, are there any questions about this procedure? Uh, um, okay, so this is something like linear algebra over three groups, only that it's not linear. Um, you have to use these tricks. Um, all right, and so this is the last step in our whole um, story or process. It's if there are any closed circle components in the preliminary diagram we came up with. We run this Starling's folding algorithm. Um, and whenever we fold two things together, which should belong together in the preliminary diagram, we insert a band sum. So I'm Banding together an arc with a closed circle. In the end, I get just an arc where this closed circle has been joined in and the closed circle kind of disappeared or it was swallowed into the arc. Um, and now, when you've done all these band sums, what you end up with is an honest to God shadow diagram, realizing exactly the map we wanted to realize. And this is my last slide and I, I'll stop after this, but the upshot of all of this is, um, if I hand you these epimorphisms from the punctured sphere group to a free group, 
I can realize them by these trivial tangles algorithmically. And then I can put pairs together. Um, and if these things are again pre-groups, um, I know that this object I've constructed is a valid bridge trisection of a smooth denoted surface. And this gives us now a one-to-one -one correspondence between bridge trisections of smoothly knotted surfaces with group trisections, specific group trisections of um, the fundamental group of the surface complement. And um, again, there is a way of modding out these stabilizations. to get an honest statement about surfaces. Okay, and I um, should say a concluding sentence. Um, this process shows that in theory, studying bridge trisections of knotted surfaces is an algebra problem, but the algebra problem is probably way too hard to actually solve. It's, it's more a translation and a curiosity, but I don't think that anyone would start working with these cubes instead of the actual surface. Um, but it's nice to see that this group transaction business, which worked for closed four manifolds, also works for surfaces inside of four manifolds. Yeah, and so, Thanks a lot for listening and I'm happy to discuss any of this. Um, here's just a, a list of references, um, maybe in chronological order, the three manifold story and then the four manifold story. All right, let's uh, thank Ben for the talk. questions. I'm sorry, I just wanted to know if there's an analogous story for knots in three manifolds given, uh, like where the three manifolds are given by Higgard splittings. Yeah, so we, we think so, or definitely. Um, and we were surprised as well that apparently this has never appeared somewhere. Um, and I'd be really happy if someone knew about a reference for this. Uh... Uh, maybe I can comment on that. Uh, isn't mm -hmm. just top plumbing with fibered knots uh, an example of that? Um, if you have a fibered knot, this vibration gives you a Higgard splitting. Um, and plumbing a hop band is, uh, is, a, is a stabilization, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there's this story that um, any pair of fibered knots can be related by stabilizations and destabilizations. Mm -hmm. um, However, just, I don't know, yeah. you know, if you want to get rid of fiberedness, then I don't know if something like that still holds. Yeah, um, does this Higgard splitting determine the knot? If I and the vibration. Um, yeah, I think so. If you have a fibered knot. Yeah, so you take two opposite, you, you have this vibration map from the complement of the knot onto S1, and then you take the fiber of the, you, you think of the, of the S1 as S1 in the complex plane, and then you take the preimages of one and of minus one.
I, I, I don't know, I just, I was just commenting on what Philip was saying, because to me, it seems like a statement that goes in a very different direction, like as opposed to looking at fibered knots, because then you remove the knot and you study the three manifold that's left and you have a, your splitting of it. But here, like your, your surfaces, they live in the four manifold and you just look at how they intersect this, like transversely, I would say, the, the thing along which you are trisecting. And so you, you look at the bits of the surface on each of the three parts. And what I would want is something like tangles maybe inside a handle body. Yeah. That come together to form a knot in a three manifold. But I, I, the, yeah, I don't know if any of this exists, but uh, to me, it seems that it's a very different thing from what Philip was describing. Well, I think, may I ask another question? Uh, yeah, sure. Which is basically the same question that, as I have been asking the whole time. I mean, oh, very similar thing. Uh, so, I mean, um, whenever whenever you have this uh, trisected um, uh, groups, uh, so how so whenever you have this cube, I always use this to to actually decide if the pushouts satisfy your condition. Uh, basically, that they are free. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it so is it easy to actually uh, do that to to check that you are in the condition you want to be? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the lemma, so maybe I flip back to this thing here. Um, yeah, so I think here deciding whether this pushout has free group should be algorithmic because three manifold recognition is algorithmic, right? And we are always in the class of three manifold groups. The um, lemma we need for our surfaces story is that given a link whose complement has a free group, then it has to be the unlink. Um, the proof of suggest is again an application of Dean's lemma, somehow where you uh, cut the different link components apart by using your algebra thing. And um, so I think your question is equivalent to the question whether unlinked recognition is algorithmic. Um, Oh yeah, maybe it seems so. I mean, I was I was kind of more uh, wondering if it's possible to do this on the group uh, algebra level, yeah. yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean that's a, that's a fair answer. I mean it's algorithmic, but uh, not extremely efficient. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know about the algebra, but I would expect it to be hard because unlink recognition sounds hard. So, yeah. Any further questions for Ben? Mm, 
So if not, then let's thank him one more time for his talk. Thank <laughs> you.